If you haven't figured it out yet by how much has been brought up in my videos, the landscape of anime culture in the mid to late 90s is something of an anomaly that may never be able to be replicated ever again. Not for lack of trying, mind you, but for lack of reconciling that it's a once in a lifetime period of time. And at the center of this once in a lifetime period is an anime that is arguably one that can only be done once in a lifetime. Neon Genesis Evangelion. From its debut in 1995 to its completion in early 1996, it's dominated the public perception of anime even today, to the point where despite it almost crossing the 30 year period since its initial inception, the original 26 episode series is still seen as a talking point of discussion as it is a benchmark for any and all anime of its nature to be compared to. So much so to the point that for the longest time possible, there was a conception raised consistently of many different animes over a span of 20 years since Evangelion being made that have had the distinction of being the next Evangelion. And spoiler alert, none of them ever lived up to that title. Going from some of the recent examples, Darling and the Franks in 2018 was often cited as being the next Evangelion with how it presented itself initially, until it went so off the rails of its plot that you'd be mistaken for thinking it was ever that title at all, which is ironic given it was made by the people who worked at the parent company for Ava to begin with. Star Driver in 2010 before it was the one to be given that distinction as well, as it was, like Darling in the Franks, seen as Sunrise's attempt to revitalize the mecha genre like Evangelion did. To little effect by the end, despite it being arguably an amazing show, it was widely seen by fans as not living up to that expectation. Go back another eight years and here comes Razathon, a series initially lauded like the past two series before it as being the next big thing for the mecha genre, heralded at its time for being the successor to Evangelion some six years after its completion, when in reality, while it's an amazing series itself, don't get me wrong, it just isn't really seen as that successor status. Hell, even going back to a series that was set to be the immediate successor to Evangelion in the vision of Escaflone, a month after Ava had a finished airing, mind you, do we see that studios were trying too quick to be the next one to succeed Evangelion, but even not understand what that means, or just not getting the point on why Evangelion was so successful to begin with. So what does that have to do with today's topic? Well more than you may think. See, not that long after Escalone finished airing did another series pop up shortly thereafter, and while its marketing in the US would have you believe otherwise, its aiming was not to try and be the next Ava, but to essentially do the one thing that every single one of the series before and even after it was afraid of doing. Try and mock the genre that Evangelion had painstakingly deconstructed. The series in question that would try to do such a task, and the subject of today's video, Martian Successor Nadesco. Or as my friend Jazzy Oliver once called it, Martian Successor My Dick So, was made as a direct response to the mecha genre in the era of post atoism that seemed to dominate the genre from 1996 into the new millennium. And while it would be easy to say that it was basically trying to take the piss out of the genre that was taking itself too seriously in the face of Ava's groundbreaking status within the industry, it's more than that at its core and arguably could be seen as more of a love letter to older mecha series such as Pre-Wing Gundam, Macross, and Mazinger, just to name a few. And while its overall trajectory as being a love letter to those kinds of shows was a nice sentiment, the way that it managed to put it in execution wasn't the best, and it turned a somewhat budding media franchise, which spanned itself across the typical manga and anime and even two Sega games, into a footnote into the anime scene of the late 90s. This is the story of Martian successor Nadesco, a story of a franchise that never was. So how did Martin Scorsese Nabisco end up being made in the first place? Well, for that, 
unfortunately a pretty basic one, to be honest. It was created by Studio Zevik, whose only other credit at the time of its creation was working on... Sorcerer Hunters. Making this their first big anime series since their creation. And while Zevik would later work on the likes of the anime adaption of Love Hina, the Mega Man anti-warrior anime, Orochi Shaman King, Le Grange, The Flowers of Rene, and... Keijo. This was their first major production, heralded by Tatsuo Sato. His only other notable work prior to the Desco was Group TAC's Soar High Isami. I actually tried to track down the full series of Soar High Isami in order to try and see what Sato's work was like before working on the Desco. But I can only find one or two episodes floating around with subtitles to be able to see it for myself, and from what I could tell... <laughs> It's very clear he was always a fan of wackier plots, to say the least. That, plus Sato's own self-professed love of the mecha genre, essentially were the two key components to what made Nadesco to begin with. As when probed about the references to older mecha anime such as Mazinger, as well as using them as inspiration, he remarked saying he had to be a fan himself when working on the show. That being said, however, Sato made mention during its production that because he felt he didn't know that much about the sci-fi genre and directing at the time, he felt that he really shouldn't be the one to go about with directing the Desco, being his second big anime production at all. But it was through some help with being led into the right direction with some harder science fiction to use as research, while he was in the middle of making the Desco, which while he felt at the time may have potentially set off a few with the purists of the genre, overall it worked very well for what ended up coming about as the result of working on the Desco. Not only that, but he also made it clear from the get-go that he wanted to make it as much a space opera as it was a comedy, and much like others that have straddled that line in the past that we've looked at, he somehow managed to get it to work without really thinking about it. Not even kidding on that last bit, Sato more or less admitted in later years that he didn't think too hard on the comedy aspects of Nadesco, as he bluntly stated at one point, it just depended on how I felt at the time. And you know what? Good for him for just being able to be upfront about it, and saying what he was actually going through at the time of writing it, instead of just having to make it some grand statement on why he did the Miss Nadesco pageant episode so late into the series run, right before the government conspiracy plot began to kick in. Not even kidding on that last bit, by the way. However, while Sato and Studio Zebek had a specific idea of marginally successful Nebraska being Mazinger Z meets Gundam for those in their native country, when it was time to bring it over stateside, it faced a very big hurdle that flied in the face of that sentiment. When Nadesco was being pried for being distributed in the West, the people over at ADV Films were the lucky group to have picked it up. However much you would have called them being lucky for doing so was subjective, but given they were one of the two big dogs of the industry by 1998, it was no surprise that they got this series for distribution. However, it did create the first big problem for Nadesco being shown outside of Japan, as ADV Films had gotten the license for Evangelion just a few years prior, and as a result when they got the rights to distribute Nadesco stateside, they marketed it as something that it wasn't instead of marketing it as the space opera that was setting up the classics of its time. It made itself to be a series that was trying to be... <sighs> The biggest anime since Evangelion. And lo and behold, in the series that they were trying to sell to the budding anime market of the late 90s as the best anime show of all time as voted by Japanese anime fans, while also touting itself as being big as the other mecha series that they had brought over previously, who did they get to play the main character? The same person who voiced Shinji Okari, of course. Spike. Fucking Spencer. Taking away Spike Spencer as a person for a second, because to be honest, if we were to talk about Spike Spencer the person and not Spike Spencer the voice actor in this section, 
we'd probably be getting this video demonetized very quickly. But the issue with Spike Spencer voice get Kira Tenkawa, the main protagonist of this show, makes it very clear early on that ADV Films were dead set on making this as one-to-one -one on the marketing for Evangelion to appeal to the most baseline of anime fans. And by doing so, they more or less shot themselves in the foot early on with how the show presents itself in the latter parts, as many people expected the same wimpy protagonist to become the reluctant big damn hero through trial, error, and anime obsession. We'll talk about that one in a second. Not only that, but they also tried to market it as some kind of space harem anime with the multitude of cute anime girls on board, both at the start and as the series goes on. Trying to turn it into some weird hybrid to try and appeal to all audiences, to little to no effect. The point with this is that ADV basically marketed it as a complete 180 from what it w actually was about, and therefore already had an uphill battle when they tried to sucker people in with its blatant lies and false promises with Spike Spencer as their poster child. And the sad part is, is that ADV could have just marketed it as the series it was presented as in Japan originally, and it would have worked just fine. They proved they could do that when they brought over Macross originally into the West, and look at how beloved that was for its time. But that wasn't ADV's intention. They knew that Evangelion was a moneymaker given that they were still selling the series like hotcakes, especially given that End of Ava and Death and Rebirth were literally being released at the same time. So they figured, why fix what ain't broken? Even if it wasn't even the right way to do it to begin with. But what was Nadesco actually about anyway that made this bold approach by ADV Films such a bad move to begin with? Well, let's dive in, shall we? So, as mentioned by now, Nadesco was made essentially to send up the mecha genre's roots of space opera in the face of it needing to be taken as something more seriously and much more deeper in the aftermath of every series trying to go down that route since Ava became a thing. However, the way that Nadesco managed to show this off was through taking it as a back-to-basics approach of its storytelling giving us slight hints of a much bigger plot at hand through its opening scenes giving us a clear guide to the events at hand, setting us in a very clear time frame of 2195, showing off some very ominous alien life forms, and giving our protagonist some very early onset trauma to boost as his motivation. These are all staples of the genre from the 80s and 90s mech anime, even down to the big platoons of fighters in space and government figures being old men in weirdly big outfits all within the first minute. That being said, however, the, that initial look into the series quickly melts away as we're introduced one by one to the main group that will be our main characters, and from our first look at our foul protagonist Akito being unable to properly work as a chef due to PTSD or for his experience on Mars during an air raid, and then getting fired over said experiences, it helps set the tone for not just our main protagonist, but also the series itself. See, Akito is meant to be a pilot as he's been branded with the mark of someone who can pilot the mechs in this show, known mainly as the Estevalis units. And as a result, there's this expectation that he is meant to be a pilot as a result of this. Of which he's just like, nope, not doing that, I want to be a cook instead! Even to the point where, even though he's basically being told by the government that he needs to be a pilot when he joins the United Earth Front, he already tells them he, that he much prefers cooking instead, and basically outright says that he doesn't want to fight. Even if he does admit that the mechs are pretty cool for what it's worth. It's only with the introduction of two other characters that that Akito actually does become a pilot for anything other than other people's expectations to do so. Yurika Misamaru, childhood best friend and captain of the battleship Nadesco, and Guy Daidoji, the, the original sole pilot of the Estevalis units aboard the ship, and a complete weeb alongside Akito for the in-universe anime, Gekigeger Free, itself a parody of 60s through 80s mecha anime. It's with both Eureka and Guy's influence on Akito does he end up not only being inspired to probably become one of the pilots aboard the Nadesco, but also fight against the, at this point unseen, Jovian forces and defend the Earth alongside Guy. 
that is, of course, for the first three episodes when, in a shocking twist of the series early on, Guy Daidoji is shot and killed unceremoniously, and while his death becomes a major point for Akira's character moving forward, as well as a catalyst for several events later in the series, having it hit this early on shows one of the major themes behind Nadesco. War is cruel, sudden, and unkind. This, amongst many other future moments, are basically showing the audience that for as much a love letter this show is to earlier mechas it's inspiring to be like, it's also very much a savage critique on the aspects of war in almost all mecha anime. Where while they mostly show it off as being WOW COOL MECHAS GO PEW 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 and POLITICS 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 Nadesco on the other hand shows the cruelties of war some years before the likes of Gundam would show it off in more recent tellings of its franchise. To that end, it could be seen as total whiplash to some viewers who didn't expect this as the otaku pilot, who loves his old mecha series, gets gunned down not in the line of battle, but in the hangar of the mechs aboard the ship. And from that moment, the turn of the series does change quite a bit. The episodes following after not only deal with the immediate aftermath of Guy's murder, but also with the fact that due to so many people being killed in the line of battle, that they have to actually start arranging funerals for them all. The reality of war comes crashing down on not just the crew of the Nadesco, but the audience as well. This feeling of realities of war permeates the remainder of the show itself, mind you. And while it does work in a way to be able to process how everyone is dealing with the reality of how war is hell, especially Eureka, because goddamn does she go from plucky happy go lucky captain to oh dear lord what is happening within the first 12 episodes. However, it's within those first 12 episodes that, while the series promises a semi-episodic format focusing on an attack each episode, and even introduces more members of the Nagal space fleet alongside their own Estevalis units, but it's at episode 12 specifically where the series itself dives headfirst into a concept which for many could make or break it, as during a Christmas episode where Akito is attempted to leave the Nadesco, does he not only reveal to everyone that he can bosun jump, which is basically how they are able to transport from one side of the galaxy to another, but the reveal as well that the Jovian forces that they've been facing off against are actually fans of Geki Ganger Free, like Akito and Guy. This is then coupled with the reveal that not only are the Jovians fans of Geki Ganger, not only are they humans that were banished from the moon of all places and formed their own society, but the society that they created was based around Geki Ganger. Oh my god. That premise may seem like a bit of nonsense, but it actually works as another bit of storytelling for the Desco as a series, and ties into its critique of mecha anime as a whole by specifically targeting the fan bases of certain shows over how they perceive said media, and overall take upon what they end up consuming as fans. The big thing for Nadesco's glance at fandom is that it more or less is one that takes a very, very black and white picture on the face of what would essentially be otaku culture. Not exactly akin to Addo's cynical take on it, but instead showing a more comical approach to how fans of certain shows are shown in this context. On one side, you have the likes of Akito and Guy, people who, while taking the series a bit too seriously for its own good, more often than not are the ones who quite literally are the kinds of fans that mainly take it on at face value, not necessarily looking at it in any deeper way and enjoying it on that surface level. It isn't necessarily a bad way of viewing most media. Hell, some may even think of them as the best type of fans as they don't exactly call for many people to try and find meaning in a show like Geki Genger, which is more or less a by the numbers anime in universe, but it gets them so riled up that you can't help but want to see them enjoy their dumb anime in peace. On the other hand, you have fans like the Jovians, who literally turned the entirety of the Geki Ganger series into their societal manifesto, taking on board the series as a literal gospel and making it the lifeblood of their way. Think of it as an early implementation of how fandom could effectively become an all-consuming of a mentality, similar to how Star Trek fans in Futurama literally in canon made a religion out of the OG series. And the two ideals not only clash in terms of value and what the series means to each side, but also in terms of what they take from said meeting as a whole. 
as the Jovians are so stubborn in the series that even though Akito and Eureka end up trying to find a peaceful solution with them over their ideals brought from Gekigenger to meet them in the middle with them, it doesn't work because they take it so seriously that trying to use Gekigenger on them is akin to heresy. And for the time that it came out in, as well as today, there are some fans that would take it as seriously as the Jovians would. But there's a lot more today that are just so comfortable loving it for what it is, and nothing more than that like Akito and Guy were. And Nadesco, as much as it is a love letter to Mecha, is also kind of putting up that mirror to certain types of fans who act like the Jovians would. It's one of those series that makes you want to try and think about your own ideals on certain shows, or even fandom as a whole, while trying itself to be one that could fit in either camp. And there's so much more that I could say to try to sell you on the series alone. Ruri's entire character arc being the inspiration for the Kudere archetype, the trio of pilots that come in to replace Guy being some of the most best characters in the entire show, the fact that they have an entire recap episode being done in the universe of Gekigenger as they watch the Nadesco cast perform it, Akito and Eureka's entire story being one of the most comedic romance plots that doesn't feel like anime harem bollocks and Akito himself being one of the better shinji light characters to come since the time of Ava that doesn't feel like it's being forced upon even with the talent of Spike Spencer behind it. But like a lot of shows we've talked about on here, I feel like if I mentioned too much on how the show itself is, it would give the game away on how much of an amazing series this is for its time. But I hear you all asking by this point, if the show is so good that you don't need to go into it as much as you have like series like Utana or the like, why do you cite such a disappointment that it's a franchise that never was? Well, without spoiling it too much, the anime itself was good, but it's what followed that kind of sank the ship. First place to start is with what immediately followed up the series as the continuation following on from the series events. Nadesco, The Blank of Three Years was released in the September of 1998 as a visual novel that tells three years worth of events that lead into the next stage of the franchise, which we'll be covering shortly. However, while the game itself was slightly successful as a continuation, it had three main faults to it that basically were collective nails in the coffin for the franchise early on. Like most anime tie-in games of the time, it was released on the Sega Saturn, a console of which had two target audiences in mind for any games on the console, Weebs and Sega Diehards, which fortunately meant that it had a perfect home on the Saturn but it was at the worst possible time for the console. See, this was around the time that the Sega Dreamcast was going to be released in Japan, with the next-gen console for Sega being two months away from being released in 1998, meaning that the people who would be potentially buying games for the Saturn during this time were potentially saving up to get the Dreamcast instead. That was already strike one for the game that was meant to be a continuation of this franchise, second one being... This really should surprise you, but Blank of Free Years wasn't released outside of Japan. The Saturn wasn't nearly as successful enough outside of its home country that that most, if not all, anime tie-in games on the system were effectively ignored as the anime boom had yet to hit properly in the Western world to such a way it would necessitate supply and demand for it. Even then, though, Nadesco wasn't exactly that big of a smash hit for the time, and wasn't even shown in the West until long after the series' initial peak had fizzled out. It was kind of unsurprising that Blank of Three Years isn't properly established the fans of Nadesco outside of Japan due to its issues plaguing from it not being fully completed. But honestly, even within its home country, it's not like it was safe from having issues of its own being present within it, as with Strike Free. Yep, in a baffling move by the creators of its of the series, Nadesco's follow-up canonically was a, released a month after the bit of the franchise that actually came out, making it not only hard for fans of the series to keep up with the timeline chron chronologically, but confused in general with the actual events of its follow-up taking place, 
As, without the knowledge presented in the blank of three years being present, the actual initial sequel to the anime that came out in cinemas a month prior either makes no sense in terms of what comes after, or downright ends up being one of the biggest total whiplashes of any anime not just of its time, but of all times. Which, speaking of that sequel anime... Nadesco the Motion Picture, The Prince of Darkness, released in Japan in August of 1998, a good year and a half after the finish of the series in March of 1997, taking place three years following the series' conclusion and the events of which aren't established well on in the actual movie itself, hence why Blank of Three Years elaborates on said timeline events. And while Prince of Darkness isn't exactly a dumpster fire of a movie, it isn't exactly a grand statement on why Nadesco was going to be the next big thing in anime, as the movie more or less was fine, but as a continuation of Nadesco's series immediately following the mainline series, it wasn't a great look when the story basically makes you feel so lost in what's going on for the first 10 minutes. Can confirm with that statement, by the way, as I more or less spent the majority of this movie talking to a partner of mine who I was watching it with the first time, and distinctly going, What the fuck is going on here? throughout the entire movie. And that's because, for as much as Prince of Darkness wants to take itself seriously as the sequel entry to the series, and have it be where the series is meant to go from here, it arguably was the biggest reason why this movie, while commercially successful, absolutely torched the franchise potential. Prince of Darkness arguably could have been the lone saving grace to ensure Nadesco wasn't just a one-note anime series with a spin-off that kind of went nowhere. But its biggest sin is that for all of the goodwill that the mainline Nadesco series brought up as a result of its themes, the movie instead goes for the route of being too overtly serious for its own good. Yes, some of the elements of the main series' fun nature are still there, but putting it very bluntly here, it's too little to counteract the ways that Prince of Darkness takes the core elements of Nadesco and smashes it with a sledgehammer subtly labeled late 90s edginess. And I say that with as much kindness as possible, because to say anything that might come across as a bit hurtful towards what this actually was, since to be very blunt about it, Prince of Darkness takes any aspects of the original series' lighthearted goofiness that came from it, and instead of replacing it with anything that could benefit from it, what it does instead is turn it into what it was trying not to be. Another dark mecha series. As an example, Akito and Eureka are the biggest examples of those affected so negatively by this, as their lovebird story goes from goofy shenanigans and a potential missing persons plot prior to Prince of Darkness, to them being used as experiments by the Jovians, who have stripped themselves equally of any aspects of likability of their Geki Ganger obsessions. And as a result, Akito Tenkawa goes from a Shinji XP who slowly came into his own to just a brooding dick with an all-black ensemble and a new mecha that, albeit with a pretty good design to be honest, fits the dark return for his character. And Eureka becoming a massive CPU for the remaining Jervians, now calling themselves Martian successors, to use for their piloting systems due to both her and Akito being high-class jumpers. Long story short, they took the ending that had a more optimistic tone, despite its general, yeah, we're aware this isn't great, but we're gonna do our best to fix things vibe in the story, and the general commentary of what the mecha genre had become by the time of its airing, and turned it into what it was basically commentating on the entire run. In essence, it alienated its core audience and further alienated the audiences they were choosing not to be a part of to begin with. It was a lose-lose situation either way you look at it. And yet, while it wasn't the final nail in the coffin, it was sadly the largest ones to seal the lid on it for good. Because what came to follow arguably didn't do worse damage to the franchise, but it did show its biggest problem of all. A year later in 1999, Nadesco The Mission were released for the Sega Dreamcast, being a direct follow-up from Prince of Darkness, as well as another game in the Nadesco franchise. To say that it had a lot to handle with being the next installment was... 
an understatement. It not only had to follow up on the aftermath that is P.O.D.'s left turn for the franchise basically forced the course of the series onto so sharply, but it also had to be its own separate entity as a game for people to suddenly pick up and play. Did it succeed at either? No! Look, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it by now. Nadesco the Mission, while it was a much better game than The Blank of Free Years was, that being that it has actual gameplay involved instead of just being a glorified light novel in disc format. But the way that they pull it off feels... odd. Long story short, you play as the captain of the Nadesco B, the newer Nadesco that had been introduced in Prince of Darkness, and have to mingle about with the characters in the series as well as the movie, during which time you can engage in RPG-like space battles, similar to JRPGs of the time like the Shining Force series, which is fitting given that it's also the same title as most Shining Force games. And instead of the Martian successors as enemies, you face off against the likes of the Space Australians known as the Crimson, who have had their own separate agenda away from the United Earth defense, and therefore need to stamp them out so that they fall in line. And that is, honestly, the crux of the biggest issue here. Instead of leading into what ended up happening with Prince of Darkness, the turn that the mission sets up basically feels like they're trying to backtrack from the vibe that the series was on. But the course correction for the mission feels... A bit forced, honestly. There's no real follow-up to the whole traumatic experience from Prince of Darkness. Akito doesn't show up that often, if at all, within it, and in general, aside from subtle design changes from the movie, it kind of decides that Prince of Darkness happened, but not to dwell on it much. And I feel like that's worse than continuing down the same path that Prince of Darkness was going down initially. And turns out that was the same feeling a lot of others had, since the mission would later end up being the last piece of Nadesco media the series had to offer. As in 2005, the director of the series Tatsuo Sato would confirm that a Nadesco 2 they had been pitching for six years by that point had effectively been cancelled. And really, after six years of trying to get it off the ground to no avail, in an age where the mecha genre was both embracing its past, as well as reveling in what it had become so badly, could you really blame Sato for cancelling it when he did? I mean, this was 2005. The industry was about a year away from Code Geass debuting as the new hotness for the mecha genre. Macross was having its resurgence as well as Gundam, for better or for worse, was finding its footing after Wing basically indulged in the late 90s Kool-Aid too much. But the less said about the Seed series, the better in my opinion. To be honest, it's no surprise if he looked at what the mecha genre was at the time and decided it didn't need an Nadesco series anymore. Every other series coming out yearly was doing its job anyway. It did what it needed to do. Hell, you can even find some elements as to what Sato was bringing to the table in his later works for what it's worth, as his contributions to the anime adaptation of Bodacious Space Pirates and Le Grunge, The Flowers of Rene. The latter being a reunion between himself and Studio Zebek after 13 years, showed that he didn't lose his spark for the genre, he just needed to switch gears a bit. But aside from showing up in the Super Robot Games series every so often after its final game had released, the enduring legacy of Nadesco through his works, and even the mecha genre that we see now, proved that his ideals of the time were basically ahead of the curve. And for as ill-advised as some of those decisions were at points, it's proof that even one series can leave a huge impact on not just the culture, but of the overall industry it was born in. And for that, while it will never be remembered as fondly as Evangelion or Gundam are today, its legacy is worth holding on to in the end for what it did not just for the mecha anime of the time, but even of now.